I want to I want to set the context with a short film. It's um very it's a it's a two minute film. It's actually directed by Tiffany Schlein, who's here, and it's a uh, it was made as a tribute for the 1950 sorry the 50th anniversary of the free speech movement, which was three years ago. So let me see if I can get a little play. With that rousing uh, introduction, I am absolutely so delighted to introduce our uh, our three speakers today. We um, we are and, and, and very much they are they, they're they're from the uh, from this glorious moment in our history. And I I, I think it hasn't I don't know if this has been said in, in, yet um, today, but I, I do want to say that I feel that the the free speech movement was one of the reasons I came to Berkeley, and I think that's true for many other. Uh, individuals who like to push boundaries, to challenge conventions, and 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 question authority, and so so this movement has been a profound legacy for for this university. And I've, I I I firmly believe that it's it's a responsible responsible for many of the great innovations and ideas that have um, emerged in, since in, since its inception in 1964. So we have we have. Uh, the, the, the members who have been here, who have been championing this, um, pro, this, this, this moment in history. Um, first of all, Lynn Hollander Savio in the center is, um, has, was, was there. She was, uh, she was there. She also had the, uh, had the privilege to be married to, to Mario. Uh, Steve Lustig was also there on the, uh, on the floor with his, uh, with the, who then became his wife. And we're going to hear from the, each of them about their, perspe their, 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 their perspectives. And Barbara Stack uh, was not there at the moment, but has become an amazing champion of the, of the free speech movement archives. And so she maintains a website. She does a fantastic job communicating with free speech movement members. And let me just ask, are there anyone else from the movement in here in the audience? OK. So uh, she, she really has, uh, she does this fantastic. I, I, and they also organized an annual event, which was last night, which was the Mario Savio Memorial Lecture, which is held every year. Uh, on campus. That, that's Lynn. Oh, that's Lynn. Okay, I'm sorry. So Lynn, thank you for that. So um, let me just ask you, you to give your perspectives, and I would like to start with Lynn, and then we're going to open it up for some questions from them. And we only have about uh, 30 minutes or less. So, uh, well, in fact, we only have about 20 minutes now, but we'll keep it. We'll keep it moving. All right, Lynn. Which is, which is operational? Like that is, yeah. Oh. Okay. I'm sorry. So how about, how about tall, this? Too tall for me. How about, <laughs> just, just, 
Let me see if this will work. Um, there we go. Hello? Yes. Okay. Actually, I have a very loud voice. Can you hear me? Oh, I just talk webcast. like this. Or for the webcast. Oh, for the webcast. Okay. So, you, you so I do need this. Yeah. Okay. You just hold it. Sorry. Okay. Um, Okay, so I got involved with the free speech movement first by picketing, which is what happened first when the university put down new regulations. I don't think this is coming through. It is. It's working. It's working. Okay. Um, Anyway, I'm not going to go into the events of the uh, free speech movement, which you can read about on the website that Barbara maintains. But the, uh, the FSM was really a kind of anomalous movement, I think, uh, because it started with an infrastructure of all the campus organizations it had an infrastructure, um, so a built-in leadership, although that leadership changed because it depended on the leaders of the various organizations which formed an executive committee and from that there emerged a steering committee. And the membership, the individual members changed, but uh, it had this very firm structure. And because it began with an, uh, a regulation that affected the whole campus community from through left and right groups, it, um, it naturally created a dialogue between the left groups and the right groups, which did exist at that time. There were not only young Republicans, but there were the Young Americans for Freedom um, who supported Barry Goldwater, and there were the also the more moderate Republicans. Um, so we already had a um, structure that required dialogue. And one of our main objectives was to keep this, this wide structure that affected, because it affected all the groups. Uh, we did not succeed in that, actually, in part. And some of the conservative groups pulled out, but they continued to say, we support your objectives, we support your goals, we don't support your met methods. Because when we started committing civil disobedience, as we felt forced to do, um, they objected to that. But they were still very committed to the goals of free speech, and it did not create a bitter kind of conflict. So, so that was a very strong objective, to keep the movement together, to keep a unified goal, and to engage the whole campus community in supporting this goal. The other thing that we had going for us was a strong tradition of nonviolence that had been created by the civil rights movement and that many of the people who participated in the FSM had had training in. They'd, there were leaders of the Congress of Racial Equality, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, um, and so forth. So that tradition of nonviolence uh, really um, affected us strongly, and we were able to keep the movement nonviolent. And it was very short, because we had a very limited goal. And I don't know if, you know, if we had had to struggle for years or for uh, even months more than we had, whether we would have been able to keep the discipline and the civility of the movement going. Um, but um, the current, current Mario's ideas of free speech really had a, an almost religious quality to them. He saw free speech as the essence of human dignity, the ability to speak freely as the essence of human dignity. 
and what he said was it was the it was what set us off from the stones and the stars and uh, so that idea of free speech which has an almost religious quality was what inspired us we were motivated by our commitments to civil rights as well as to other causes but but that was the the image of free speech that that was promoted a kind of um, that would allow us to really engage to dialogue and so forth also because we were limited by our communication means which I think Barbara will go into more we had to talk to each other we had to go out into the university we had to go to the living groups we sat at tables and we actually talked to real people and argued with real people and we also promoted the idea of the university as a community that in fact it was the, uh, the university preferred not to look at the political aspects of our struggle but at the fact that we were so alienated and so separated from each other that uh, that what they had to do the mission of the the university was to increase community but the FSM actually built community because we were able to you wore a button you saw that the other person was supporting you you could talk uh, you sat on the terrace and you talked to people so the FSM emerged with these ideas of of free speech of dialogue and of community and when Mario gave the victory speech at the end of when we won the um, the right to speak freely and engage in political advocacy on campus without fear of the university punishing us for that he gave a speech in which he talked about responsibility he talked about how now within the boundaries of free speech which are so wide we now had to consider the idea of being responsible because you could say a great deal that was not responsible and that I'm afraid is what the place where we have gotten to now that many many groups from left to right have um, no longer consider it necessary on this campus to speak responsibly um, we also um, I'm trying to fi figure out here which page of my notes I want to keep on <laughs> okay um, so the idea of, when I was a kid there was a thing on the report cards that said self-control uh, and I always got a C or a D in self-control and my response was I can control myself perfectly well it's the teacher who's trying to control me if I don't want to talk I won't talk you know um, but the idea of self-control is really what is fundamentally at the bottom of responsible speech that's what and that was what Mario was calling for it no longer seems to be possible to expect this a community sense of community here a sense of self-control um, or self-policing and I think this this attempt now when things have gotten so destructive is really um, I'm sorry I'm I've had not much sleep in the last couple of days it, it is necessary to restore the idea of Berkeley as a community that the university is a community that we have to consider the effect of our ideas the effect of our, of what we say upon that community and so it's important that we feel a part of that community the people who have talked about how right-wing students or conservative students feel on this campus um, 
I don't, I'm not here on the campus, but that is a problem that has to be dealt with. I disagree with many of their ideas, but I am not God, I am not the, you know, the dictator here, and I have to acknowledge that they have a right to express those ideas and not be vilified for them, just as the people on this campus should not be vilified for their race, for their immigration status, or for their ideas. Um, I think that there are several ways of dealing with this. I agree with Reich's, Professor Reich's idea about laws that help us control our own information. I think that, that the problem of doxing is, is really abominable. I mean, it's, it's just beyond belief what people feel free now to say about each other and to each other. And we need to expand the, ro the, rule, the laws that, that can keep the government or anybody from, us from getting our information. We need to increase the institutional support for people who are doxxed. And we need to promote ideas of forms of protest that do not intimidate and the, that do not um, try to deplatform people, try to drown out what they say, or um, as Antifa or other people do, just stop people physically from speaking. We used to police ourselves when we would have marches and we would police ourselves and I think that we would be scared to do that now. I mean, I, you know, we, there have been suggestions maybe us old folks could come out and, you know, try and do the security at, uh, at events. And I would, came to the campus a week ago Wednesday and saw BAM people and uh, one of these patriot groups, and that wasn't the Berkeley Patriots, screaming at each other and I thought, there's no educational value, no value for anything. I couldn't hear what anybody was saying because they were all talking at the same time and trying to drown each other out. And um, it was really scary. And walking through the hundreds of police that were massed on campus, I, couldn't f I felt, how could anybody have an education except in... <laughs> in the, on these matters, on this campus, how could you focus, how could you think about things? I'm, I'm going to stop now, and I'm sorry for the disorganization of this talk, but um, the problem I would like to see through this year in which you are going to be discussing these, these kinds of things not only the ideas of promoting legislation that can control what is revealed about us on the internet, but also a real effort be made to build a community here at the university in which people can talk to each other in a respectful kind of way. And it may be beyond um, what we can anticipate at this point in, in society, but that idea of respect for each other and for our, person, our persons and for language needs to be promoted in the university as much as possible. Hi, everybody. I was a high school senior in New Hampshire in the fall of 1964. In 1984, Nancy Skinner and Eleanor Walden hired me to work on the 20th anniversary commemoration of the FSM, hosted by the Grad Assembly. I recognized in the issues and the history and the people I met something to cherish. 
I'm now on the FSM Archives Board and am its archivist and webmaster. The idea of free speech is deceptively simple. In fact, it takes time and effort to understand it well. In 1964, it took the Berkeley campus almost a full fall semester to get it right, and it was and is worthy of the effort. Alas, free speech doesn't stay learned on a campus and must be revisited. I applaud Chancellor Christ for getting it right from the beginning and for realizing what it would take to share the lessons with the entire campus. I should point out that the 1964 UCFSM was not the first student free speech movement. The struggle for free speech at City College of New York, 1931 to 1942, is notable, as is the 1934 UCLA free speech movement. For details, see our website, fsm-a.org, and Robert Cohen's book, When the Old Left Was Young. On this campus, there, was, there were serious free speech issues in the 1930s, and for that, you might also look at Peter Frank's interview on the OAC website. The 1964 FSM is often celebrated for its marches and rallies and occupations and general posture of resistance. Participants, however, tend to recall its endless meetings, indoors and out, where valiant speakers did their best to persuade and most tried to understand one another. This should not be overlooked. The First Amendment was to the FSM really more of a tool or portal for the original work of many of the FSMers, civil rights. And it, it has been alleged that there was a secret sub rosa mission of the FSM. A few claim it was the spread of communism. Many, many more, however, agree that it was in fact the 14th Amendment, ratified in 1868. This is the amendment that outlaws states from denying citizens life liberty or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Among the slogans of the FSM was first and 14th or fight. And so the 14th Amendment is also worthy of your attention. The FSM was terrific at social media. They excelled at public address technologies, oratory, printing, photography, songwriting, singing, and the recording and release of professional 45 RPM and 35, 33 RPM records. They issued crafted handbills and press releases almost daily. They made no posters, but they had a polished newsletter and at least one active cartoonist. They created slogans, pins, armbands, punch card mementos. A set of FSM punch card is currently on display in London's Design Museum, part of a show on Cal California designs. And the FSM students wrote letters to home, lots and lots of them. The issue dominated dinner table conversations around the state for at least three months. Many FSM participants understood, even as it was just beginning to unfold, the historical significance of what they were undertaking. They preserved all the reproduction masters for their handbills and press releases. They saved a set of uncirculated documents. Many individuals kept personal collections and preserved them for decades. The FSMers understood that they existed in time and had a substantial grasp of both the past and the future. In the midst of all the activity in the fall of 1964, Lynn Hollander and Michael Rossman organized a crew to write and publish a review of campus past and present political issues, much the work of the campus organization Slate. And this was titled Administrative Pressures and Student Political Activity. It remains a significant and useful document, and there's a full transcription on the Bancroft website. And almost all of these collections mentioned have made it to 2017. So the FSMers were quite deliberately trying to hack the future, even as they mined and challenged the past, and hacked 1964 itself. 
It was with this goal that the Free Speech Movement Archives was birthed in 1996. Michael Rossman wrote, our motives are as holy as cherry pie, to testify for free speech by passing our history onto our children and, be and beyond, along with the live charge and complexity of understanding it as best we can. I think that the critical issue now is not whether hate speech should be counted, but where in the legal system restrictions on free speech, uh, where, where the restrictions should be encoded, and how, what is rule, what is practice. Time, place, and manner make an appearance in both federal jurisprudence and in campus regulations. It's time to get to the details of these matters. And finally, I believe that there is a great potential for free speech to be a unifying issue across a wide political spectrum. There's much we can agree on. A few months ago, the FSM archives made a statement on free speech. Breitbart carried a quotation from it and listed our names. A few weeks after that, I was at a memorial service and caught the eye of someone I knew to be conservative who was across the room, and he came over to talk to me. And he said, is it true? Are you really for free speech? And I said, yes, indeed. Uh, our position is more or less, uh, let the bigots speak, and let the bigots be heard. And he said, it's incredible. You're for free speech. And I said, yeah, what else could we be for? And you know, there's a whole lot of nonsense going around these days. And he agreed with that, too. Thank you. So I transferred to Berkeley uh, in a timely manner in 1964 from Northwestern University, which has a great reputation. But at that point, they had allowed no political activity and no organizations on campus. So I was rather frustrated. And Berkeley had this great reputation. So I thought I'd transfer to Berkeley. And I happened to luckily hit the free speech movement. Uh, I was arrested, I went to jail, and uh, while I was being arrested, I met the person who became my wife and we're still together. So if you want to date, demonstrations are not, not, not a bad way to do it. Uh, a lot has been said already, uh, some of the points I was going to make. Uh, I think the issue of free speech has been hijacked somewhat. Uh, oh, I want to go back to another point. I was also a vice chancellor at Berkeley many years later, and the police department reported to me. So things go around and come around. Um, the, uh, I think the issue of free speech has been hijacked, and that's al already been said. But I want to go back to the point people are making about what was this all about? What, what was the free speech movement about? And free speech became the issue for political organizing. That was what we were after, was organizing and creating solidarity. So there was a, the whole building community was a big piece of this that we wanted to build community across lines and divisions of people that disagreed with each other. We wanted to focus on the issue that we were all there for, which was organizing political engagement in our community. And I think that that idea of solidarity, that there was a commitment to solidarity from the right and the left that forced people to come together and have dialogue. And that's somewhat missing. It doesn't happen when you're anonymously on your, on your internet. So I think that it's not going to go away. There's a lot of, you know, should there be, should there be limits, should there be this, should there be that. Clearly, social media is here, but the face-to-face -face interaction has to be there. And you can look across movements that are happening, like Move On or Swing Left, any of these, that have a strong media presence, a lot of social media interaction, but behind that is a core of people discussing their differences and coming to strategy and they're in it for the long haul. They're not in it for the momentary email that they can send out. So I think that this whole idea of connectedness is not just a digital connectedness, it's a human connectedness that I think we're all after. It's about relationships, and, and speech is about relationships, listening is about relationships. So I, it's, I just want to make that point that the combination of face-to-face -face interaction, focus, leadership, and solidarity are all behind what needs to happen for free speech to be real. And, uh, and I want to leave it there because we're short on time. And I'd like to hear from you also. <laughs>